Chapter 51 God's Care for the Poor To promote the assembling of the people for religious service, as well as to provide for the poor, a second tithe of all the increase was required. Concerning the first tithe, the Lord had declared, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel. Numbers chapter 18, verse 21. But in regard to the second, he commanded, Thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 23 and 29, chapter 16, verses 11 to 14. This tithe, or its equivalent in money, they were for two years to bring to the place where the sanctuary was established. After presenting a thank offering to God and a specified portion to the priest, the offerers were to use the remainder for a religious feast in which the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow should participate. Thus provision was made for the thank offerings and feasts at the yearly festivals, and the people were drawn to the society of the priests and Levites, that they might receive instruction and encouragement in the service of God. Every third year, however, this second tithe was to be used at home, in entertaining the Levite and the poor, as Moses said, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 12. This tithe would provide a fund for the uses of charity and hospitality. And further provision was made for the poor. There is nothing, after their recognition of the claims of God, that more distinguishes the laws given by Moses than the liberal, tender, and hospitable spirit enjoined toward the poor. Although God had promised greatly to bless His people, it was not His design that poverty should be wholly unknown among them. He declared that the poor should never cease out of the land. There would ever be those among his people who would call into exercise their sympathy, tenderness, and benevolence. Then, as now, persons were subject to misfortune, sickness, and loss of property. Yet, so long as they followed the instruction given by God, there were no beggars among them, neither any who suffered for food. The law of God gave the poor a right to a certain portion of the produce of the soil. When hungry, a man was at liberty to go to his neighbor's field or orchard or vineyard and eat of the grain or fruit to satisfy his hunger. It was in accordance with this permission that the disciples of Jesus plucked and ate of the standing grain as they passed through a field upon the Sabbath day. All the gleanings of harvest field, orchard, and vineyard belonged to the poor. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, said Moses, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt." Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 19 to 22, and Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Every seventh year, special provision was made for the poor. The sabbatical year, as it was called, began at the end of the harvest. At the seed time, which followed the ingathering, the people were not to sow. They should not dress the vineyard in the spring, and they must expect neither harvest nor vintage. Of that which the land produced spontaneously they might eat while fresh, but they were not to lay up any portion of it in their storehouses. The yield of this year was to be free for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and even for the creatures of the field. Exodus chapter 23, verses 10 and 11, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 5. But if the land ordinarily produced only enough to supply the wants of the people, how were they to subsist during the year when no crops were gathered? For this the promise of God made ample provision. I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, he said, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And ye shall sow the eighth year, 
and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year. Until her fruits come in, ye shall eat of the old store. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. The observance of the sabbatical year was to be a benefit to both the land and the people. The soil, lying untilled for one season, would afterward produce more plentifully. The people were released from the pressing labors of the field, and while there were various branches of work that could be followed during this time, all enjoyed greater leisure, which afforded opportunity for the restoration of their physical powers for the exertions of the following years. They had more time for meditation and prayer, for acquainting themselves with the teachings and requirements of the Lord, and for the instruction of their households. In the sabbatical year the Hebrew slaves were to be set at liberty, and they were not to be sent away portionless. The Lord's direction was, When thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock, and out of thy floor, and out of thy winepress. Of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. The hire of a laborer was to be promptly paid. Thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Special directions were also given concerning the treatment of the fugitives from service. Thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee, even among you, in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates, where it liketh him best. Thou shalt not oppress him. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 15 and 16. To the poor, the seventh year was a year of release from debt. The Hebrews were enjoined at all times to assist their needy brethren by lending them money without interest. To take usury from a poor man was expressly forbidden. If thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him, or increase. But fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 35 to 37. If the debt remained unpaid until the year of release, the principal itself could not be recovered. The people were expressly warned against withholding from their brethren needed assistance on account of this. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand. And thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. The poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 to 9, and verse 11 and verse 8. None need fear that their liberality would bring them to want. Obedience to God's commandments would surely result in prosperity. Thou shalt lend unto many nations, he said, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 6. After seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, came that great year of release, the Jubilee. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound throughout all your land, and ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a Jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. 
Leviticus chapter 25, verses 9 and 10. On the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement, the trumpet of the jubilee was sounded. Throughout the land, wherever the Jewish people dwelt, the sound was heard, calling upon all the children of Jacob to welcome the year of release. On the great day of atonement, satisfaction was made for the sins of Israel, and with gladness of heart the people would welcome the jubilee. As in the sabbatical year, the land was not to be sown or reaped, and all that it produced was to be regarded as the rightful property of the poor. Certain classes of Hebrew slaves, all who did not receive their liberty in the sabbatical year, were now set free. But that which especially distinguished the year of Jubilee was the reversion of all landed property to the family of the original possessor. By the special direction of God, the land had been divided by lot. After the division was made, no one was at liberty to trade his estate. Neither was he to sell his land unless poverty compelled him to do so, and then, whenever he or any of his kindred might desire to redeem it, the purchaser must not refuse to sell it, and if unredeemed, it would revert to its first possessor or his heirs in the year of Jubilee. The Lord declared to Israel, the land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. For ye are strangers and sojourners with me. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23. The people were to be impressed with the fact that it was God's land which they were permitted to possess for a time, that He was the rightful owner, the original proprietor, and that He would have special consideration made for the poor and unfortunate. It was to be impressed upon the minds of all that the poor have as much right to a place in God's world as have the more wealthy. Such were the provisions made by our merciful Creator to lessen suffering, to bring some ray of hope, to flash some gleam of sunshine into the life of the destitute and distressed. The Lord would place a check upon the inordinate love of property and power. Great evils would result from the continued accumulation of wealth by one class and the poverty and degradation of another. Without some restraint, the power of the wealthy would become a monopoly, and the poor, though in every respect fully as worthy in God's sight, would be regarded and treated as inferior to their more prosperous brethren. The sense of this oppression would arouse the passions of the poorer class. There would be a feeling of despair and desperation which would tend to demoralize society and open the door to crimes of every description. The regulations that God established were designed to promote social equality. The provisions of the sabbatical year and the jubilee would, in a great measure, set right that which during the interval had gone wrong in the social and political economy of the nation. These regulations were designed to bless the rich no less than the poor. They would restrain avarice and a disposition for self-exaltation, and would cultivate a noble spirit of benevolence. And by fostering goodwill and confidence between all classes, they would promote social order, the stability of government. We are all woven together in the great web of humanity, and whatever we can do to benefit and uplift others will reflect in blessings upon ourselves. The law of mutual dependence runs through all classes of society. The poor are not more dependent upon the rich than are the rich upon the poor, while the one class ask a share in the blessings which God has bestowed upon their wealthier neighbors. The other need the faithful service, the strength of brain and bone and muscle that are the capital of the poor. Great blessings were promised to Israel on condition of obedience to the Lord's directions. I will give you rain in due season, he declared, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. And ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and ye break my covenant, 
ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 4 to 17. There are many who urge with great enthusiasm that all men should have an equal share in the temporal blessings of God. But this was not the purpose of the Creator. A diversity of condition is one of the means by which God designs to prove and develop character. Yet He intends that those who have worldly possessions shall regard themselves merely as stewards of His goods, as entrusted with means to be employed for the benefit of the suffering and the needy. Christ has said that we shall have the poor always with us, and He unites His interest with that of His suffering people. The heart of our Redeemer sympathizes with the poorest and lowliest of His earthly children. He tells us that they are His representatives on earth. He has placed them among us to awaken in our hearts the love that He feels toward the suffering and oppressed. Pity and benevolence shown to them are accepted by Christ as if shown to Himself. An act of cruelty or neglect toward them is regarded as though done to Him. If the law given by God for the benefit of the poor had continued to be carried out, how different would be the present condition of the world, morally, spiritually, and temporally? Selfishness and self-importance would not be manifested as now, but each would cherish a kind regard for the happiness and welfare of others, and such widespread destitution as is now seen in many lands would not exist. The principles which God has enjoined would prevent the terrible evils that in all ages have resulted from the oppression of the rich toward the poor and the suspicion and hatred of the poor toward the rich. While they might hinder the amassing of great wealth and the indulgence of unbounded luxury, they would prevent the consequent ignorance and degradation of tens of thousands whose ill-paid servitude is required to build up these colossal fortunes. They would bring a peaceful solution to those problems that now threaten to fill the world with anarchy and bloodshed.